When Mitch Daniels served as governor of Indiana from 2005 to 2013, he would apply what he called the Yellow Pages test. That is, if some agency or function is listed in the Yellow Pages, the government shouldn't be doing it. During his eight years in office, Daniels led one of the most successful cost-cutting and privatization campaigns in modern political history. He contracted out welfare services, started a school voucher program, slashed the size of the state workforce, and ended collective bargaining for public employees. In one of his most controversial moves, Daniels leased a 157-mile toll road to a group of private investors, a deal that brought nearly $4 billion to the state. By the end of his second term, Indiana's workforce was 18% smaller. Its credit rating was upgraded to AAA for the first time in history. And even the state's long-hated Bureau of Motor Vehicles had become known for its excellent customer service. This record, in the face of recession, led some Republicans to pine openly for a Mitch Daniels run at the 2012 GOP nomination for president. But the governor declined. Now the president of Purdue University, Daniels has kept his thrifty habits intact privatizing some services, and applying a tuition freeze to keep higher education affordable for middle-class families. This May, Mitch Daniels became the first recipient of the Reason Foundation's annual Savas Award for Public-Private Partnerships. I sat down with him for an interview before the ceremony. You inherited deficits of $200 million. 800, um, but eight. who's counting? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, why public sector unions? Why is that a focus uh, straight out of the bat? What's the importance of that? Well, it wasn't primarily about money. We had to address that the old-fashioned way and, and uh, re, uh, reconcile uh, spending with revenue and so forth. Um, no, it was much more about, uh, call them work rules, but there were something like 160 pages of do's and don'ts uh, in these agreements that the state had signed. And I used to say, you know, you couldn't pick up a coffee cup from one desk and move it to the next without a 30-day, 60-day consultation with somebody. You certainly couldn't, as we were determined to do, um, combine departments, uh, break off uh, departments for uh, more direct supervision. You certainly couldn't outsource anything under those conditions. We'd have been um, pr paralyzed, really, to, from um, doing those things that would make government work. So it was much more about making a totally dysfunctional government operate effectively within the, the zone, the more limited zone that we thought it ought to operate at all. Now, Wisconsin obviously became the site of three years worth of, yeah. worth of scuttlebutt over this. Even though there was Hurricane Mitch, and I'm sure it felt uh, crazy in the eye of the storm, it didn't feel like the same kind of thing. Why didn't that happen in Indiana? In terms of well, well uh, we were able to strike quickly and did. I get, here, now, here's a confession. I, I don't often uh, procrastinate or overcogitate and so forth, um, but on that decision, I really spent a long time. I was trying to talk myself into either uh, waiting till after the legislative session or um, uh, maybe splitting the baby somehow, maybe these important departments and not these. Uh, the, the key distinction was we didn't need legislation, as in almost every uh, other venue, including the federal government when JFK did it. Collective bargaining was in, which FDR and, uh, you know, Fiorello, LaGuardia, and lots of friends of unions always said had no place in the public sector, had gotten there always, almost always through executive orders, later codified in statute. Indiana. Uh, the advocates of collective bargaining never got got it into statute. So I had the ability, which Walker did not, uh -huh. to take it out by executive order. I tried to persuade myself, uh, though, that maybe we shouldn't do it right away because I could imagine a scene like we saw in Wisconsin. And I thought, man, the whole rest of this agenda, we got this huge agenda of things that we think are really important to do. And I could imagine it all being brought to a halt if we had a, an eruption like they did. Instead, on day, I just finally decided, no, we cannot fix this place under these conditions. We're just gonna have to take this action and hope for the best. So I went and told the union leaders myself, my first day in office, thought they deserved to hear it from me. Went back, signed the order, pulled up the covers and held my breath, <laughs> and nothing happened. Except that over the first 
mm, about 11 months, 90 plus percent of the state employees stopped paying the dues. Wow. Once it was their choice, they gave themselves a pay raise. I think the swiftness, maybe, uh, maybe they just didn't think we'd do it, but um, uh, we did it, and then uh, their members began to speak, at least tacitly, and uh, it was never an issue. And you, this led to you be able to reduce the state workforce by some 18 percent. Tell, tell us about the kind of knock-on practical benefits that you received from doing yeah. that. Yeah. Some of it had to do simply with being able to organize the government for better effect. G good example, uh, we had the worst child protection system in the country. HHS was fining us, and probably deservedly so. The ratios of people who are supposed to be watching over these in endangered children were way out of whack, no training and all that. So uh, we had pledged to do something direct about that, pulled it out of this massive social services bureaucracy and created a a unit entirely of its own reporting directly to the governor. And five years later, we were winning national awards. Um, but that's that sort of, uh, of restructuring or combining units that, uh, and, and, and uh, extracting the synergies that were possible there. Um, uh, you know, in most of life, I always say I'm pretty much a libertarian. But when it comes to IT, I believe in dictatorship. You can't <laughs> let everybody have their own computers and their own little customized software so nothing talks to each other, right? And uh, so uh, uh, establishing one unitary and unified IT system across all of government, I still bump into people and say, how did you get that done? Because it's a, it's a problem that afflicts um, a lot of large organizations, private and public. Uh, so things like that. We were able to go straight for them. You know, we went right away to uh, a new benefits plan, which is HSAs. Indiana uh, rather quickly had almost all state employees on a what we now call a consumerist or a high deductible plan. The, the penetration of such plans in public sector America, last I looked, was about one, wow. one or two percent. And we must have been half of that because we were 90 plus. Couldn't have done that saved buckets of money, employees wound up with millions of dollars accumulating in their accounts, which are theirs, as you know how that works. And um, uh, likewise, Indiana, as far as I know, is still the only state that has a, uh, we reformed the civil service rules such that uh, uh, employees are paid for performance, not in lockstep grids. Uh, the best performers got the biggest pay raises by far in state history. Those at the other end got a warning and um, often uh, and a second chance, but that's that's uh, all they got. Um, so um, uh, those are the sorts of things. It was now that translated into dollars. Sure, it did. But I just am stressing here that our principal objective was to um, uh, demonstrate that government actually could deliver. Every state hates its license branches, right? I, I guarantee you Indiana probably had a candidate for the worst. I used to say that if people went to an Indiana Bureau of Motor Vehicles office with a box lunch and a copy of War and Peace <laughs> and hope not to finish both of them you know, before somebody noticed they were there. Um, so by about three or four years in, they're winning national awards. I'd get a report once a month. The average visit time, door to door, was down to nine minutes and something. The average customer Wait, satisfaction was 97 percent. At a DMV? That's right. That's crazy talk. Well, I live in Brooklyn. I think the average time is five and a half days. Maybe something. Business school case has been cases have been written about it. It's a very interesting uh, story all by itself. A lot of that was accomplished, by the way, by creating all sorts of ways that you didn't have to go to the branch in the first place if you didn't want to, right. online, in the mail, on the phone, et cetera. But, um, um, and you know, I was really fixed on those things that touched lots of people. So everybody has to deal with the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Everybody has to deal with the Department of Revenue. We really worked hard on those. So people could see the practical benefits and understand. Yes, because, it, and I saw that also as an important investment of capital in that metaphorical sense because, um, you know, first of all, I'm a limited government person of the first order, but I don't think that um, 
uh, unadulterated cynicism about government is healthy for our democracy. And so, uh, number one, I wanted people to develop a sense of confidence that the folks running the people's business uh, really were con uh, committed to trying to do it well. And the second thing was uh, that we want to build momentum for the next reform. And literally, I think a lot of people concluded, well, they can fix the damn BMV. Maybe that new idea they've got is worth a look to. Talk a little bit about privatization, um, both in terms of what you did there, but also where did you get acquainted with and enamored with the idea to begin with? Yeah. In, in the early 90s, a lot of people were enamored with it. I was convinced it was such an obvious and smart thing to do. So a fellow named Osborne was reputed to be Bill Clinton's favorite uh, you know, thinker at the time, and he writes a book, Reinventing Government, or something was the title. And it's all about this, uh, using the uh, private sector where appropriate uh, to deliver services more effectively and efficiently. Sure. Um, a very uh, a good a friend and a really good uh, public official named Steve Goldsmith got elected mayor in my hometown, and when he was running, um, I said to him, you know, you're going to want a signature a thing. Your predecessors have had some big ones, and you, you should want one. I said, this business of of uh, privatizing services for the benefit of service recipients and taxpayers is a good one. Why don't you have a, I said, why don't you have a citizen's commission to go look through state government and see where the opportunities are and aren't? So he got it, you know, so big mistake because he, he makes me the chairman of the commission. We got some great people, some good business people, and they, they um, we divided local government into functional areas. People went in and came out with, I don't know, a host of ideas. So that's where I got, and most of them got acted on. So that's where I, um, I guess got the notion, but I got a lot of it from reading Reason Magazine. Not to kiss up here, but it's true. <laughs> and uh, Bob Poole. Sure. All this at a time when I had no um, intention, uh, no premonition that I'd ever hold elected office myself. That's interesting. No, I just never expected that to be the case. But uh, it came when it came along. I had uh, the benefit of of the reading I'd done and, uh, and the, uh, experience, that one experience. Now, the most notorious or infamous or something, least controversial privatization was, I guess, one of your first, which is the toll road. Uh -huh. How, why was that controversial, of all things in the world, yeah. to be controversial? Well, it's an, inter it's an interesting thing, because it, it is, the, it is the, beyond any question, it was a slam dunk, grand slam, spectacular success. I mean, we were very self-critical in our administration. Most things, you know, give yourself a B or B plus, but not this one. We had valued the road in public hands around a billion three, billion four, and you had to make some rosy assumptions to get it up to that. And I had told myself, if the bids come in, if their bids aren't well over two, we probably won't, it, it won't be worth going for it. But if they get up there closer to what we're aiming at, we will. So the bid comes in $3.9 billion. Unbelievable. And when I announced it on a Monday morning into a jam-packed room, all the, you know, there were gasps and cheers and clapping, and everybody in that room at that moment believed this thing would fly because holy cow. Well, you say what happened? Uh, xenophobia happened. The, uh, the, the notion that, uh, well, first of all, there was just some vague sense which our partisan opposition uh, pounced on that uh, maybe we were giving something up, you know, people didn't understand necessarily the transaction at the beginning. And, maybe we were, and then the fact that the financing was organized by a foreign entity, uh, Australian bank. You know how those Australians can be, come on. Yeah. Yeah, a friend of mine said he went in a barber shop when the thing was really white hot and people were in there arguing about it. And he said, he finally said, you know, you're right, it's worse than, it's even worse than I thought. I'd just been out there, they've changed all the signs to Australian. <laughs> uh, so it became what could have been and should have been a bipartisan celebration, it became a very partisan thing. But, you know, we got it through and uh, the results speak for themselves. We're, 
we're in the tenth of ten consecutive years of record infrastructure investment in Indiana. And uh, there are more than 200 projects that wouldn't have happened that did, including some big ones that people had waited for literally for decades. And, um, uh, and a big fraction of all the bridges in the state were rebuilt. So there's still more to do, always will be, but it was a, it was a tremendous uh, piece of luck for the state. Here's the thing that haunts me. On that day when I made that announcement, I pointed out that as of the closing that we uh, were headed for, this would be the largest such transaction in American history by a factor of two. It was about twice as big as the Chicago Skyway, which was the biggest one at the time. I said, but that won't last. That won't last a year because this is such an obvious uh, partial answer to the national problem we have of infrastructure that other places, it's, it's being done all over the world already anyway. It's just a little late getting here to America. Look for this to happen in a lot of other places. Astonishingly to me, we sit here a decade later and it's still the, it's still the record and that's a darn shame. Your record as governor of Indiana at a time when we went through the financial crisis, when we started seeing trillion dollar annual federal deficits, got you very much in the conversation in the 2012 presidential race, like he's the wonk, the government coming wonk that we need. Uh, and somewhere in 2010, I guess, you made a, a statement that had libertarians just high-fiving and conservatives not quite so high-fiving about how Republicans or conservatives need to start thinking in terms of a truce uh -huh. on social issues. Um, looking back on that and transposing it to today, do you still feel that? And what's your assessment of the way the Republicans are going after issues like gay marriage or pot legalization or, or even immigration, if you see that as a social issue? Yeah, it's still my view. Uh, by the way, it wasn't, the comment wasn't directed just at so-called conservatives. It was directed at their uh, uh, opponents on the other side, too. It was a general appeal. Um, based on my belief, which is stronger now, several trillion dollars of debt later than it was then, that we have urgent problems. We've got to get this country on a pro-growth footing. We've got year, we need years of consistent high growth if we're going to remain a country of upward mobility and opportunity. And we've got to get, we've got to begin the process of flattening this debt burden we're about to dump on future generations. And I thought that uh, it would be wise to try to rally the nation and focus the nation on these problems which we all share. And I chose the word truce advisedly to, to distinguish it from surrender or, um, or retreat. You know, just stand down, agree to disagree. Let's try to see if we can't work on those things that genuinely threaten us all. That was the idea. And I think it's absolutely true today. You know, we've, we've just come through a, a little storm in, in my home state. Oh, yeah. Uh, where I think there was, some, there was some misunderstanding and some unfairness and all that. But still, I think it illustrates the fact that, that, uh, that these uh, kind of issues can get in the way of, of truly serious business. And so um, uh, I, uh, I, I think that this is... Uh, this, this idea has a lot more uh, uh, agreement than many people think it does. Even in 2012, after I had, it was 2011 actually, after I had uh, retained my senses, not you know, run for national office, uh, a uh, Wall Street Journal reporter who had uh, trailed me around a little bit and I'd gotten to know called and said they had put a question on that subject on their poll and Republican primary voters agreed with the idea of the truce by something like seven to one. So um, there are people who are very, very passionate about those issues. They have a right to be and, and they will be heard. But I think um, in growing numbers, um, Americans um, are more concerned about other things and many more are inclined to a, a live and let live at attitude.
How terrified are you of an $18 trillion debt and the entitlements coming and washing down when there doesn't seem to be a lot of discussion, even on the Republican side, um, anymore about doing much uh, about that? What, uh, what is your articulated dread when you're wake up in the night sweating and thinking about the future of our accounts? You know, it's going to be a huge drag on growth. It already is. Just wait till interest rates return to anything like, like normal from these artificial levels. And um, uh, there are certainly situations in which it could uh, threaten the country's future more, uh, more, more seriously than that. And um, it's, there, there's a moral aspect to it. I don't think that it's, um, by the way, I don't blame the American people. They've been misled about how all these things work. It's just my money. You know, they stuck it in a vault, in a drawer for me. I'm just taking it out. You know, people have been uh, actively misled about it. And um, um, I don't think too many of our fellow Americans knowingly would plunder their children, would borrow tons of money and spend it on themselves, to, on consumption for themselves today. That's exactly what we're doing. So I think there's a moral dimension, an economic dimension. I even worry about the national security implications um, of, of a country that will soon be spending uh, upwards of two-thirds of all its money on um, uh, transfer payments and interests. You were director of the Office of Management and Budget. I always yeah. get one of those words wrong. Yeah. Um, at uh, the kind of dawn of the Bush era, Bush, looking in hindsight, was no great fiscal steward of these United States, even if you isolate military post 9-11 spending. What went wrong with Bush conservatism and fiscal conservatism? Oh, you know, those numbers I think have been largely misrepresented. Uh, I'm not defending every decision that, that was made at that time. There were, uh, I, I would have strongly preferred you know, less spending than happened. But, um, you know, what first thing that went wrong was a bubble burst. So everybody, um, I'm, I was one of the guilty parties, although so was Alan Greenspan, so was the Congressional Budget Office, so was everybody, the Federal Reserve and everybody else around, misunderstood that the revenue that was coming in temporarily in the late 90s was a base from which you could project some sort of growth. It wasn't. And when the stock market bubble burst, those revenues, a lot of them evaporated. So the apparent fiscal strength of the country was somewhat illusory. And uh, then there's a recession that followed the bubble. Then comes the war, the decision, right or wrong, to build a homeland security capability, and all these things piled up on top. So um, I think after you've uh, factored all those things, yeah, there was some spending sometimes uh, to, to uh, uh, accommodate a Congress um, that was reluctant necessarily to, you know, fund the war on terror spending. I mean, it's a Some unified Republican Congress for a large part of that. Part well. of that time, and uh, so again, um, I, I think the the uh, um, it's really ahistorical to suggest that somehow uh, you just you just spent the spent a flush treasury bear. That's just not what. Well, it I think it's more that total federal spending, yeah. non-defense, grew by 50% yeah. in eight years, which is not fiscally conservative by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. As I sometimes said, I never had a disagreement with anybody during the two and a half years I was there where I was for more spending than they were. <laughs> and uh, when we got a chance in uh, Indiana to, to deal with a fewer zeros, but a very serious uh, uh, fiscal problem, we found a way to do so. Yeah, you were referencing um, reinventing government in the yeah. 1990s and kind of intellectual stuff and even a reason our recent former editor a beloved uh, figure Virginia Postrel wrote a book called The Future and Its Enemies yeah. I understand that that had some influence on you talk about that a little bit no I thought it was a wonderful insight that and it certainly informed or, or colored my thinking when I got to office the dichotomy she illustrated between uh, stasis and dynamism or, and those who are um, comfortable with change, recognize that it's largely inevitable and therefore the, the goal ought to be to shape it and, and uh, adapt to it effectively. Um, and uh, as I mentioned already, 
Indiana historically has been a change of earth state. And our whole um, argument, everything we said and everything we tried to do, every spe I speech that I gave for 10 years basically, uh, had as their central theme, that won't work anymore. That if you tread water in this world, you will sink. And if you stand still, you will be passed by. And that I wanted Indiana to be an active vanguard state. And I think I can document that a a after eight years, we were, we were looked to in a variety of ways, whether it's infrastructure or you know, fiscal um, probity, or education reform, or property tax controls, or you name it, um, or government that works. Now, talk about your role, Purdue, a little bit here. In most of the country, including where I'm from, California, the story about universities is all about a higher education bubble. It's about tuitions trending like this. Mm -hmm. You've actually cut tuitions? Do I have this right? Frozen. How, frozen tuitions. How are you, have you been able to do that? Edict. <laughs> I mean, um, I don't consider that we've done anything particularly uh, dramatic yet. Um, I uh, suggested to our board that we do this, and I'd only been there two or three months when the decision had to be made. And so I didn't have nearly the information to be sure, but I had a suspicion that we could do it. And, you know, limits have a lot of value. Um, that's why. Uh, balance budget requirements, uh, lead people to you know, make decisions they wouldn't otherwise make, establish priorities that they wouldn't otherwise establish. In business, um, when times are flush, people are a little uh, not as attentive uh, to that expense account or the, you know, the uh, less essential items. Sales go flat, suddenly people sharpen their pencils. So I thought if we establish that limit, and, and I said to the campus, look, we all care about this, don't we? We all would like this to remain a school that students from any income level, they can meet our standards, can afford to attend. And people at Purdue do agree with that, faculty, staff, everybody. So I said, so let's all find ways to, to make, let, do this. Let's just, I, I said, let's uh, try something different. Instead of asking our students' families to adjust their budgets to our preferred spending, let's adjust our spending to their budgets. We did it once and then we were able, as it turned out, to extend it. This second year will be at least one more year. Um, to an extent, it's a statement that we believe that, that uh, uh, higher education uh, uh, ought to be of the highest possible value and that controlling costs, maintaining uh, access to the extent we can is important part of that. So how have you done it? What's the, uh, what's the blueprint for uh, Purdue? Well, um, it, it, people always want to know what, what some great master stroke. There weren't too many of those. Oh, we had a very, very expensive uh, health uh, care uh, benefit plan. We modernized it. It's more consumerist and it's overperforming in terms of as it has all over the country. You know, the minute people get a little bit of uh, skin back in the game, they start to ask common sense questions and we had that experience in Indiana state government in a big way. So that was one. We consolidated uh, information technology there too. Wow. Big, big savings. I think you being involved with two successful large-scale IT projects put you on a very short list of people. Most, uh, well, most I, such things I, I won't claim to have contributed anything except the, uh, except the determination that it had to happen. Uh, For those of us who don't spend a lot of time on college campuses and get our information through oftentimes partisan media, it can seem like it's just a hell broth of micro-triggering <laughs> and people in free spa speech cages yeah. over in a corner. What's your assessment of the climate of free speech on campus nationwide and at Purdue? Is it as bad as some of us suspect? In places it obviously is. We all read about them and you, you just shake your head. Um, <laughs> I can, I can tell you that Purdue is different, and I think there, you don't hear about the places where free speech is respected and protected. Uh, naturally enough, you don't. Um, uh, we feel very strongly about it, um, about to take some further actions to ensure that what's been a, a, a good record uh, remains that way. And we've uh, 
Uh, we, we've identified some small policies that were less than uh, uh, ideal, and we're we're changing those. But uh, no, I th I think that the spirit of free inquiry is still strong on our campus, and I hope on most. But clearly, there are places where uh, the uh, uh, it's violated in in uh, truly unfortunate ways. Well, thank you very much for, yeah, I uh, for talking it. Thank to you us. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for the the good work and the and the uh, you know provocative work that Reason's always done. Always been a courageous place and uh, one that uh, held faithful to principle. That's why I've been a reader. Uh, often agreed, not always, but uh, was always uh, stimulated. You mean you're not ready to legalize heroin? I don't understand. Uh, stop short of that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you. It should be a fun evening tonight.